Evangel 7th grader Michael Gilreath was diagnosed with autism when he was in the second grade. When we first got the official diagnosis that yes, Michael has autism, I, I, was, I was crushed. I didn't, um, I thought this limits his opportunities for the rest of his life. Early in life, things were tough for Michael, both at home and at school. When I was very little, I used to go to a different school before this. And I was also bullied by this little boy. He's always mean to me. That's when Michael's parents, Todd and Cindy, started looking for a new school. Dr. Cheryl Marsiglia pointed them in the direction of Evangel Christian Academy Center for Autism. And it was a perfect fit for Michael. You hear the stories on, on the news and on Facebook about, you know, this autistic kid sits alone at, at lunch and whatnot. Not here. We kind of went from parents who would be worried about our child's autistic, he's a little bit different, is he going to be bullied, is he going to face problems, and he was a rock star. This newfound popularity has a lot to do with Michael's personality. His family also credits the Bridge Program, which uses reverse inclusion, meaning they bring kids who are not on the autism spectrum into the classrooms to mentor out-of-the-box kids. This is where Michael's relationship with Evangel quarterback Blake Shapin developed. Blake came in open to learn from Michael, and Michael came in open to learn from Blake, and it was instant friendship. It kind of takes a little while to kind of build a relationship with them, but once you start building a relationship with them, like, you start seeing strengths in the way they talk to you, like the way they communicate with other people and stuff like that. Michael is also on the Evangel wrestling team, his first year wrestling varsity competition. He's competing against kids much older than him. On November 8th, Michael was victorious for the first time. That was the biggest moment of my life, aside from, you know, my children being born. The, the feeling is just indescribable. To see him overcome so much and then to get a win, I was overwhelmed. Since then, Michael has gone on a tear. He wins all the time. I get strong and I win a bunch of matches. And it makes you feel pretty good when you win? Yep. When he realizes his full potential, these wins now are going to be dwarfed in comparison from what he accomplished, not only in the mat, but in, but in the world. Um, Michael was so surprised the first time he got a win, but none of us were. He's now in an environment where he can thrive. His self-confidence is soaring, and the sky is the limit for Michael Gilreath, both on and off the wrestling mat. One of the unique laws of Louisiana is that there is no wiggle room on contracts. I've had to learn this the hard way. Everything in a business deal or transaction is contained in the borders of the contract. So you better make sure you have somebody on your side that understands how to create a contract. And then when it's time to contest it, you better make sure that you have somebody there that is able to interpret it. All I can say is that contracts are important not only in Louisiana, but they are important in the kingdom of God. In fact, God is a contract God. God works in a divine legal system called the kingdom of God. And it is a contractual system. It is a legal system. It's the way God thinks. It's the way God acts. It's the way God works. It's the way God will always work. In fact, in the Word of God, we call it covenant. We call it covenant. Now, the Bible is filled with covenant language because from cover to cover, there are very important covenants that God makes with man. 
In fact, the Bible speaks of seven different covenants. Some of those you're familiar with, the Abrahamic covenant, um, the Palestinian covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Uh, those are all covenants made with the nation of Israel. But the covenant that we are going to focus on today, of course, is the one that we are currently under. And it is what we know as the new covenant, the new testament, the new testament. Now, if we are to define covenant in relationship to the new covenant, we would define it most accurately by saying the new will. This is a will and a testament. And in this will, you find the things that you have inherited because of the death of what the Word names the testator, which is the one who died and left you all his stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about that and the uniqueness of this testator a little bit later. But first of all, let's turn to Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and read the initial promise concerning this new covenant, this new testament. I want to speak to you on the subject today of pray the covenant. Pray the covenant. Turn to the person beside you and say, Pray the covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And what you need to understand is that the new covenant was made, first of all, with the Jewish people. The Jewish people were perfect for the new covenant because they had the foundation of the old covenant. You say, what do you mean, the old covenant? Isn't the law that horribly oppressive document? No, no, it, it isn't really. Uh, the law is wonderful. The only problem with the law is that man couldn't fulfill it. The law is actually a document that reveals to man the way God would live if he was living on the earth. The law says this is the way God would treat his neighbors. This is the way God would treat women. This is the way God would treat other people's property. This is the way God would speak to elders. This is the way God would deal with family. This is the way God would deal with lost property. That's what the law is. It's just a revelation of the way God would live on the earth. In other words, the way that the God-man Adam should have lived on the earth, but he wasn't able to accomplish that. And man couldn't live up, live up to it, and so we had to have a new covenant, and the new covenant would basically be a fulfillment of the old covenant by the Lord Jesus Christ, and then an empowering of all of us who are under the new covenant to live because of His grace, according to the great standards of His own character and His will. Now, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember no more. 
Everybody that loves the sound of that, give the Lord a great round of applause for his new covenant. And that describes exactly what happens with the new covenant. The new covenant is a heart thing. Say a heart thing. It's not a covenant that is on paper that you're trying to get into your character, but is rather a transformation of the character so that what God says suddenly, powerfully, and supernaturally makes sense. How do you know you've entered into the new covenant when what God asks you to do makes sense? The Bible says this, the things I once loved I now hate, the things I once hated I now love. It's talking about a revolutionized covenant heart. It's talking about somebody who has received the covenant of the blood of Jesus in their lives and suddenly it has transformed everything about them from the inside out. They used to live in a world where they loved to do these things on a regular basis and now they detest those things where they hated doing these things on a regular basis. Now they love to do those things. Where praying was out of the question. Now they just love the presence of the Lord. Where going to church was something that they tried to get out of every excuse in the book. Now they just can't wait to get there. Where forgiving people was something they were never compelled to do. And now they know that they not only need to forgive, they want to forgive. We're talking about a changed heart because the new covenant takes place from the inside out. Say the inside out. And when you start living from the outside in, you begin to live under the old covenant again. You must always live from the inside out. A transformed heart that is able to grasp the very character of God much to your absolute amazement. You are loving God. Look at you. I mean, just look at you sitting here this morning. What in the world are you doing here? Nobody ever expected you to be here in church on Sunday morning and never missing. Are you kidding me? You know what you used to do with Sunday mornings. And look at you. I mean, you're crazy. That's what your friends think. What they don't know is that you bumped into the new covenant and the new covenant is not about a change of mind initially. It's about a change of heart. It starts from the inside out. Hallelujah. <laughs> Above all other things, God remembers and honors covenant. Let me say that again. Above all other things in the Bible, God remembers and honors covenant. Here's what the Word says, that He will honor His covenant, His Word, above His name. And everywhere you read Word of God throughout the Scripture, you can replace that Word with covenant because they are one and the same. Thy covenant have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Your covenant is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my covenant shall never pass away. Listen to these statements. Exodus 2.24. So God heard their groaning, talking about the Israelite people. And God remembered, listen, his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exodus 6 and 5, furthermore, I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. And I remembered, wow, my covenant. Leviticus 26 and 42, then I will remember, say it with me, my covenant with Jacob. And I will remember also, say it again, my covenant with Isaac. And I will remember my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. Leviticus 26, 45, but I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 4, 31, for the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor, listen to this, forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. I hope this is getting deep in your spirit. Our God is what kind of God? He's a covenant God. 
Psalm 106.45, and he remembered his covenant for their sake and relented according to the greatness of his loving kindness. Let me just say this to you. God does love you, but it is not just because of his emotional love for you that he meets you at the point of your need. He meets you at the point of your need because he made a covenant. And he made a covenant not only with you, he made it with your children. God is a covenant God. Ezekiel 16, 60. Nevertheless, I will remember, say it with me, my covenant with you in the days of your youth. Aren't you glad that he remembers his covenant with us in the days of our youth? And I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Psalm 105 and 8. He has remembered his covenant forever. I mean, it's everywhere. These are just a few of the passages. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. First Chronicles 16, 15. Remember his covenant, boy, there it is again, forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Luke 172. That's Luke 172. The word of God says this. If God is a covenant-making and keeping God, why would we not pray the covenant? Why would we not pray the covenant? If the Word of God says that God is a covenant-making and keeping God, why would we not pray the covenant? Let me ask you again. Why would we not pray the covenant? If it's what God honors more than anything else, if it's what gets His attention more than anything else, why when we pray, would we not pray the covenant? Now, I, I want to turn uh, quickly to the Mosaic Covenant. Um, and I want to just go through that quickly. Here, here's the first verse. I hope it's up there. Is it up there? Do we have it up there? There it is. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy uh, 28. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. That's in the contract. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. This is not talking about city folks and country folks. This is in the contract for all of you. God promises to bless me where I am. Glory to God. I bring blessing and favor to a place. A place does not bring blessing and favor to me. We have limited ourselves severely, haven't we? By thinking, God can't bless me where I am. He can't bless me in the job I have. He can't bless me in the city where I live. He can't bless me in my neighborhood. He can't bless me in my present circumstance. But in the contract, it says this. God promises to bless me where I am. I bring blessing and favor to a place. A place does not bring it to me. You know, I don't think we ought to be cocky people or walk with a swag, but I think as the people of God, we do have to be confident according to the covenant. You need to understand that the greatest day of your boss's life was when he hired you. And you need to walk into what you have deemed a miserable circumstance over these past weeks and months with a new attitude of gratitude, understanding that not only is God going to bless you right there, but He is going to bless there because of you. Now, verse 4, this is what the Word of God says. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. Now, look at me and listen to me because you got to get this. God 
does not change his mind. I hear people, they're so carried away with the Word of God, and they should be, but if you are carried away with the Word of God as a document and not as a person, then you have missed the whole point. Because the Bible is a revelation of somebody. And from cover to cover, Old Testament and New, we have an account of how God thinks. People in this day are so messed up when it comes to the message of grace. They have accepted a grace apart from the character of God. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God who thinks the way He thinks in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers is the same God who thinks the way He thinks in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some people feel that grace means God has mellowed with the age. He's a nicer God now, thank God. No, 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 no. He's still the same God. He was perfect then and He's perfect now. And what you need to understand about covenant is when you read all of the covenant promises that He gave to Moses, Jesus simply fulfilled all of those promises and everything God said He would do in Moses' life, He is going to do in our lives. Somebody say, it all belongs to me. Folks, I'm going to show you how to break through in your prayer life, and it's going to be revolutionary. It's only going to take me a few minutes, but you've you got to hang with me because I've got to build this foundation. It is the Word of God that builds the strong, durable foundation of truth in us. And so, the Bible says the fruit of your womb will be blessed. Now, here's what you have to understand. Just because that's in the Old Testament doesn't mean that that is not still the truth. If you are a covenant man or woman and you have children, the Bible says that just because your kids are born in your house, they are going to be blessed. I didn't say that. It's right there. And we haven't preached that. Shame on us. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. You say, that's not what happened right now, Pastor. My, I, I, you know, I, I tell you, my, my son's on drugs. I don't know where my girl is. My, my kids won't even speak to me right now. Now, Pastor, let me just tell you, they got under bad influences. Some of them got all plugged into a bunch of garbage on the Internet, changed the way they thought sexually. It's just on and on and on. These are the stories I hear. And let me tell you, I know that that is a tough, tough place that you're in. But I also want to declare to you that the Word and the covenant of God is stronger than any circumstance that your children are in. And this is the declaration of covenant that you need to pray on a daily basis. You need to say, living God, it's right here in the contract. You said, blessed would be the fruit of the womb. We had this kid. This kid's not doing well. But I believe that you are stronger than every temptation and every demonic force that is coming against him set him free because it's right here in the contract it's in the contract and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock the calves of your I want you to see your, 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 your not everybody's. But God loves everybody. Yes, He does, but He's not in covenant with everybody. You're only in covenant if you've been washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. That's when you're in covenant. Because Jesus has washed you, and when He has washed you, and when you are a believer, then the covenant applies to you, and this is a part of it that belongs to you. This your business. And the crops of your land. Somebody say my. The young of, say my. My livestock. The calves of my herds. 
the lambs of my flocks. Here's what you have to understand. When, when the Lord is speaking, he's speaking directly and intimately to people in a certain culture. This related to their prosperity and to what they produce. Look at me and listen to me and get this once and for all deep in your heart. You have the right, because it's in the contract, to pray that everything you touch and everything you produce will be blessed and fruitful. You know what some of you have done all of your lives as believers? Well, the Lord's just done so much for me. You know, I'm blessed more than most people, and praise God, just whatever He does is fine. And you know what? That is absolutely stinking thinking. You have got to become a covenant thinker and you've got to begin to pray the covenant of Almighty God because guess what? There's some other people that need to be blessed and it needs to come through your hands to do it. Don't you ever get to a place where you settle and say, you know, God's done enough for me. God wants to do more for you and that's His business. If He wants to do more for you, you need to let Him bless everything that you touch and everything that that you do. You need to let him multiply you beyond your wildest dreams and expectations. In the name of Jesus, I break the darkness of limitation off of this congregation. In Jesus' name, Satan, you stop lying and we're stopping listening to you. We are blessed and prosperous and we are moving forward. We're going to the next level because you have called us as a covenant people and it's right here in the contract. All that we touch and all that we produce and all that we put our hand to is going to be multiplied in the name of our God. Somebody, we got to begin to pray the covenant. Some of you say, well, I've had it, but I lost it. It's just like every time I start getting something good happening, it just kind of falls through the cracks. Well, this next covenant promise is for you. It says this. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You say, what in the world is that? In Bible times, reapers... Those that gathered grain carried baskets on their backs to collect the harvest from the field. And they had to ensure that the baskets were strong and sturdy so what they collected wouldn't fall out. How many of you are tired of your harvest falling out? The women of that day used kneading bowls to knead dough for making bread. And if they used poor quality bowls, which broke easily they wouldn't be able to make enough bread. Some of you are not being able to make enough bread. You need some more bread. But your kneading bowl keeps breaking. Something happens. It's almost predictable. You get something going good, and oh, I can't believe that took that part of that inheritance. That took That blessing away. Wow, we could have really used that if this other thing hadn't happened. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Come on, am I talking to you? We're talking about the basket and the kneading bowl. So the baskets and kneading bowls in those days represented the means by which one got his tangible blessings. And what you need to understand is because of the sacrifice of Jesus... He says to you, blessed shall be your basket in your kneading bowl. You're not just going to make money to lose it. You're not just going to make up ground to lose ground. You're not going to take one step forward and two steps backward. That's over because we are going to walk out of here understanding it's in the contract. I'm tired of living like that. And Satan, you're not going to deceive me into thinking that's the norm of my life and my family. I don't care if that's always been the history of the Jones family or the Smith family. Today, there is a new Jones and Smith in town. And I am going to break through and break out into new things because it's in the contract. You remember uh, when Jesus told Peter to throw his nets into the water and Peter threw 
a net down and he caught so many fish that the net began to break. You remember that? I just met a man the other day who's broke, who was giving, listen to this, he was giving $250,000 a month to his church just a few months ago. But he made a move in business and he lost the blessing. Millions of dollars. Can you imagine? 250000 was his tithe every month. And the nets broke. But do you remember after the resurrection what happened? There was a very similar incident that took place and Jesus asked his disciples to cast their net out and they caught a multitude of fish. But the Bible says this, although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now that will tell you the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. In the old covenant... We could receive a blessing, but we couldn't maintain it because of the weakness of our flesh. But after the resurrection, hallelujah, we receive the blessing, and it's not because of our goodness or our expertise or our acumen that we are able to keep it, but we are covenant people because of changed hearts. And Jesus says, your nets are not going to break any longer. Hallelujah. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Lift your hands and say, God, bless my routine. Let me tell you something, folks. A routine is a good thing. But God wants to bless your routine. He wants to, he wants to breathe fresh life into your routine. The Bible says the Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you. Does it say who might? No, it says who will. When you begin to prosper in the Lord, you're going to get enemies. When you begin to build a business, there are going to be people that just kind of break off from that business and start one just like yours right down the street. It happens in church life. It happens in the corporate world. It happens in mom and pop businesses. I'm telling you, you're going to have enemies. Some of your enemies will even be those of your own household. The Word of God says we're going to have them, but it also says this. The Lord is going to grant. Hallelujah. This means He makes a decision. This means He rules on it. The Lord is going to grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but they will flee from you in seven. Somebody put your hands together and thank God that that promise is for you. God is going to defend you, and he is going to rout your enemies. Now, the Word of God says the Lord will send a blessing on your barns. Barns? I'm supposed to have barns? That's right, my friend. You're supposed to have barns. I'm talking about your own barns. I'm not talking about barns and noble. I'm talking about your own barns. I'm not talking about visiting other people's barns. I'm talking about your own barns, your own storehouse. God will bless everything you put your hands to. God said this. Folks, look at me and listen to me. Don't accuse me of preaching a watered-down New Age gospel. I'm reading the Bible. Thank you. It says, I will bless everything you put your hand to. Come on, somebody. I will bless everything you put your hand to. You know when God began to show me this? God began to show me this when I was a football player. I could not seem to close the deal in football. I, I was I was an okay athlete, but it was just like I couldn't close the deal. I couldn't come through in tight situations. And so we began to pray about it. My mom and dad and me, I remember we prayed one day out in front of our dormitory at Louisiana Tech, my dormitory at Louisiana Tech, and we began to rebuke a spirit of fear. But we also began to decide that we were going to walk in the covenant promises of the Lord. And so this is what I would do when I would break the huddle at Louisiana Tech. It's the truth. I would walk to the line of scrimmage and I would say, I'm going to drop back five, I'm going to drop back seven yards fast as I can. I'm, I'm saying this to myself and to the Lord and to the devil if he was listening. 
I'm going to drop back seven yards. I'm going to plant my foot. I am going to look right to look that safety off, and then I'm going to hit Roger right in the chest with it. I would say that. I would say exactly what I was going to do on that play. It's a good thing that, you know, they weren't able to hear me over there because they didn't own the play. But all I can tell you is what I was doing was rehearsing my right to walk in the covenant promises of Jesus because, listen to me, this happened to be what I was putting my hand to. I was not just a football player. He said, well, God didn't care about football. Yes, he does if I'm playing it. You say, well, God didn't care about softball. Yes, he does if your kid's playing it. God doesn't care about business. Yes, he does. God didn't care about what kind of bedspread I have. Yes, he does if that's the one you want. God cares about everything you put your hand to. We do not have a dead, dry, dull religion that is somehow under the bondage of a poverty mentality. Ladies and gentlemen, we are people of the kingdom of God. And we got a king who is rich and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he said, I don't supply your needs according to your limit, your ceiling, or your expectation. I supply your needs according to my riches in glory. It's the truth. We need to begin to pray the covenant. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you watch what's about to happen to this church, I'm telling you. It's been prophesied for years, but I'm telling you it's about to come to pass. And the reason it's going to come to pass is not because there's good preaching up here or there's good praise up here, but because there's good praying out there. Because we stop praying these old mournful prayers where we think everything's about to go wrong. Folks, you need to begin to pray in victory. Some of you need, you need to stand up tall. And you need to begin to decide that you know what God's will is. And you go toward it with all the fervency and all the momentum of somebody who has discovered the new covenant. It's a good covenant and it is based on better promises. Hallelujah. Well, i got to move on because I'm, I'm not going to be able to close this. It's almost 12 o'clock. i got five minutes. Denny, Sarah, I'm hurrying. I'm going to get this done in Jesus' name. Praise God. Listen. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. Turn with me to Hebrews 8. Whew, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to the name of the Lord. Let's start reading it just to save time. Verse 7. If there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people, and he said, the time is coming, declares the Lord. Now, understand, he didn't say I found fault with, with uh, the word. He said, I found fault with the people. And said, so the time is coming, declares the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will be like the covenant I made with the forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned from them. And he's quoting, of course, uh, from the Old Testament. This is the covenant I will make in those days. Uh, Jeremiah 31, where we just read. And um, he says, by calling the covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. And uh, let's, let's go down to chapter 9, verse 11. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, Sprinkled on those who are ceremonial, unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, somebody say amen. amen, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, listen, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised 
eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Now why is it we can read this and only see the sin part? The sin part, your sins being removed, is almost a casual mention here, honestly. We know it's powerful and important. But that's the part we talk about most of all. And that's not what this passage is, is talking about at all. It's talking about the fact that this new covenant, based on new promises, now belongs to us, and that all the conditions and the promises that were left on the table because of our insufficiency as people are now possessed by all of us. That's what it's talking about. In other words... Christianity is not just about our church life and, a, and just about our preaching life and just about our ministry life, but Christianity is about walking with Jesus 24-7 and having Him impact everything that we are and everything that we do. We are covenant people. We're under a contract. Now, let me share this last thing with you, then we'll close. In, in Hebrews 9, actually the whole chapter, the covenant is spoken more of uh, in terms of a last will and testament than anything else. It, when you read it that way, then you really understand Hebrews. It's the, it's the last will and testament of Jesus, the Son of God. And, and the Hebrews writer goes to great pains to talk to us about how that you can't get the stuff in the will until the one who's willing it dies. Now, come on, you ought to be preaching with me now. And then he says, the stuff is then transferred to you by the executor. doesn't say executor, but it says by someone else who comes and is able to transfer the wealth. They interpret the contract, and they say, you know what? This contract, this covenant, this will says that, well, you get the house, and, and you, you get the car, and you get the misery that you gave the deceased. And, and But he's using language that lets us understand. And it says it clearly here. And I'm just paraphrasing. That Jesus became the condition of the covenant. He shed his blood. He died to be able to give you all of that good stuff in the Old Testament that we couldn't get on our own. How many of you say it's getting clearer, Pastor? But then he not only died <laughs> to make sure that it was legal, because everything in the Bible is a legal system, it was legal that his heirs be able to gather in a place like this and find out what was theirs. You see, that's why you come to church. It's one of the reasons. is because every time you're here, you find out something else that's yours. Because it's in the contract. But then he said, I don't need an executor. Because on the third day, I'm going to get up out of that grave after being legally dead for three days. And I am going to be the one who administers the inheritance myself. I am going to make sure I'm there to enjoy the transfer of what I've paid for and enjoy the benefits that my children are going to receive. Now, this is the last thing. you got to hear it. 
So when you view Jesus, this is what you're going to view. You're going to know it's him. The same way that Thomas knew it was him. The same way that Peter and the rest knew it was him. Because it won't just be Jesus. It will be Jesus with nail scars in his hands. And Jesus with nail scars in his feet. And Jesus with scars on his brow. And Jesus with a scar on his side that goes all the way to his earthly heart. It, it, will, be, it will be Jesus scarred strategically. Because he will stand before you. And as you look at him, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see that what we received was not a document at all. That the contract was a person. You're going to see that he kept those scars to make sure that you understood every covenant promise that you see in Deuteronomy, hallelujah, that had to do with the work of your hands that he has crucified hands to make sure that he sanctified yours and made you powerful to be able to receive everything that he has. And then you're going to look at his feet and understand that he is the contract because the scars in his feet have everything to do with you going out and with you coming in. It has to do with the fact that everywhere you go is blessed. That the place can't bless you. You're going to bless the place because the scars of Jesus Christ have been there to prove to you that he is the living, hallelujah, contract of heaven. You know, all of those tormenting thoughts that you have, you don't have to have them because he has scars on his brow. That say this, every tormenting thought has to leave. It is in the contract that you have the mind of Jesus Christ. You know that riven side that went all the way to his pure heart? The scientists are now saying that the heart is the seat of the emotions like no other time. They're saying we have, we have miscalculated the role of the heart. It may even be a second brain. Let me just say this to you. You may be emotionally distraught today. You may be in a place where you don't think that you can go another step. You may be discouraged. You may be despondent. You may be depressed. But I can tell you that here is one with a scar that says, I am the contract. And believe me, you can know that you are set free in your heart and your emotions because Jesus Christ bore the scars. And on your back, hallelujah, you don't have to worry because you don't have to pray those old dried up religious prayers. If it be your will, heal me, Jesus. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ didn't go to the cross and he didn't endure the, the flogging of those cruel Romans so that he could simply say, maybe or maybe not. Folks, I'm here to declare to you if you've got cancer, it's the will of God to heal you. I'm here to declare to you if you've got heart trouble, it's the will of God to heal you. I'm here to declare to you that if you've got arthritis, it's the will of God to heal you. I want to say that if you've got something that's passed down through your family line, it's the will of God to heal you. It is God's will to heal you. It is God's will to set you free because Jesus Christ bore the scars on his back. You see, the contract is not a document. The contract is a person, and he stands as the visible evidence that he is the testator of the contract of heaven. Come on right now. Give the Lord praise. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.